our series on, on, on the SEA will focus on these uh, new and exciting tool called the ARIES. So we have a couple of colleagues from the Basque Center for Climate Change who will join us uh, uh, then. So uh, I know we have a packed agenda for today, so I'll not spend a lot of time talking about uh, uh, sort of a recap, but just to remember that yesterday we heard from, from Short and from Joachim on uh, ecosystem extent. So how do we delineate ecosystems? And then Joachim uh, discussed, how do we measure the condition of, of ecosystems? And then today we'll hear from, from Adam on ecosystem services, which is sort of the next uh, step in the cascade of ecosystem accounts. Uh, before I share the screen to, to uh, uh, of the presentations from, from Adam, just a couple of quick reminders. Again, you can download the presentations from the website to get the, the Russian version. We do have interpretation, so please make sure you are uh, listening to the version that is best suited for you. Uh, uh, so those are sort of just the housekeeping announcements. So let me just uh, uh, briefly introduce Adam. Uh, you can see Adam on the screen as well. Uh, Adam uh, took over as uh, the head of the uh, UK uh, statistical offices, uh, natural capital work in January, uh, 2019. Uh, he came to this uh, after 16 years of work as an environmental economist, economist rather, in academia, private consultancy, as, and as an advocate within uh, an environmental uh, non-government organization. Uh, so let me share Adam's presentation here. Uh, bear with me here for a second, Adam. Uh, I hope you'll, able to, you'll be able to... to uh, command it, so to say, and, and go to the next screen, but I, I can also do it from, uh, from yeah, I just end. I just I just Googled it, and I think because I have a, a non sort of um, professional version of Zoom, I don't, I can't have that power, so I'm going to have to actually do it, sorry. So, yes. Hi, yes, thank you. Thanks so very much, and um, uh, thanks for inviting me. I uh, am Adam Dunn, I'm the head of Natch Capital. Um, as as mentioned, are we going to try and concentrate on the um, monetary accounts, the services, which is an awful lot of what we're where we've concentrated our work in terms of the methods? I think it's where the the CEA has most of its sort of um, unique selling point. I should also say I have only once before used um, simultaneous translation, and the translators kept pressing the button. To tell me to slow down. So I don't know by what mechanism you need to, but if I'm going too fast, please do let me know. So uh, next slide. Please. Ah, perfect. Yeah, so that's my team. Uh, very briefly, we're a team of around, that's almost all of my team with one person with us. Um, there's me in the blue coat. There's a team of about seven or eight. We're going to expand a little bit more, but for most of the lifetime of the accounts, it was only around three or four people working on it. So it was done with a relatively small number of people, but as you'll see at the end, it relies on a much wider group of um, data providers. If you get to the next slide. Yeah, so we've been going since 2011, and it's taken quite a long time to get to the point where we were in a position to include the accounts within the satellite accounts of our national accounts. So last year we published it in what we call our blue book. I don't know if the nations call them the blue book, I think they do, uh, for the national accounts. The uh, initial work in 2011 was begun between uh, with a mixture between our uh, statistical office and our department for the environment, uh, food and rural affairs. By 2012, the CEA EA experimental methods had also been published, which supported us. I need to speak up. Oh, sorry. Um, can you hear me at all? I, I don't know. I'll, I'll try and speak my either. <clears throat> By 2012, the uh, system of environmental uh, economic accounts had set up the first experimental um, methods for ecosystem accounting. And then by 2014, we released our first data set. So it took about three years, though I think that could be done quicker. In 2018, um, the, a white paper was produced uh, in for England, at least, which required uh, a restoration of um, nature within a generation on natural capital basis. In 2019, we produced the first Scottish accounts. In 2020, we entered the Blue Book. So it took 
around nine years to reach a state which we consider them accounts to be mature, but we think other nations could do that much quicker if they avoided some of the um, probably some of the mistakes we made and, we, and with some advice from others at this point. Um, next slide. So we're going to start. I, um, the way I was asked to do this was a relatively short talk, but to go into as much detail as I could on uh, each on a sort of service by service basis. So we're going to start off with the provisioning services. Most of the time with provisioning services, we rely heavily on the national accounts and a sort of top down approach, um, which is very quick and very easy, but does undermine your ability to provide useful analysis and, and, and value added from those numbers. So for instance, if we took the fisheries numbers for uh, from the blue book from the national accounts and estimated a resource rent approach, we firstly don't properly define the boundaries of the UK's net natural capital. I'll explain it properly in a minute for, for various reasons, because we can't see what's going in and out of that account. But secondly, we also can't understand why it might go up or down. We can't, we, all we can see is a value, uh, is a monetary value going up or down, and we can't really link that to actual catch or the sustainability of that catch. So there are reasons to go the extra mile and start providing a bottom up approach in some instances. Well, in others, the top down approach works fine. So I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more detail now. If you go to the next slide. So timber is the best example of a relatively simple bottom-up approach, uh, and it's probably the best um, example of a provisioning service since we have an almost perfect price uh, for it, and we have very, very good data, and we can project that data with a great deal of certainty. So tim uh, timber is relatively simple. So the reason we have a good price is that we can take the uh, overbark standing price for the wood, which is the price before anyone has done anything to it. It's literally just stood there in the wood. So we don't worry too much about broader up chain um, value added of cutting it down or moving it from the forest. So that's a really, that's a particularly good kind of natural capital based price. The other aspect uh, that's good is that we have full mapping of all of our productive forests and we know the age structure of those forests and we know how much has been replanted. So we know for the next 30 years at least exactly what we would expect to become mature at what time and so we can present a perfect asset or near perfect asset value estimate it, it, even if we don't you know project price changes which isn't the, what we're supposed to do anyway. Um, in the top right hand corner, you'll see uh, two little boxes. You'll see those for all of these services. The one at the top says relative value and the, one, the other one is policy relevance. Now, in terms of relative value, what we're saying is how big is this service compared to others? Is it very, very valuable? And if it's red, it's one of the lower value ones. Um, and then policy relevance, again, green, amber, red. And amber means it's a middling policy relevance. There is some relevance certainly of timber and woodlands, uh, certainly of woodlands for broader carbon sequestration purposes, but timber is not a vital industry within the UK. It's a relatively minor industry and we're not, we're not particularly big players. Obviously it's important to that industry, uh, but I think just relative to um, wider conversations. Um, and those were kind of value judgments that were done by Rocky from DEFRA. Uh, if we go to the next slide. Thank you. So crops, food and grazed biomass. Now this one causes more of a headache. And this is one where we haven't fully solved the difference between a top down and a bottom up approach. At the moment, we still rely heavily on the national approach, uh, this sort of national resource rent approach. And you can see the figure for that in the uh, sort of middling dot, the, the, middle, the line that kind of bobbles around in the middle, they're all blue lines because it's in ONS uh, colors. But um, essentially the one, so the whole, the industry residual rent is relatively sensitive um, year by year, but doesn't move around too much. And actually it's not too far away from the other two approaches which we've considered for valuing um, crops and biomass. The big problems with it are that it will include livestock value and that we're not supposed to include livestock. It's considered a produced resource. We're only supposed to consider the grazed biomass, so the, the grass that they're feeding on. 
the uh, other problems are it might even include that parts of the industry that we wouldn't want to include. So um, contracting farm, red, farm work and the like, and the income from that. Whereas all we really want to know about is the production of uh, food and the income from that. And as far as possible, we would even like to try to take out some of the technological advancements that actually support quite high uh, yields. Which is causes it makes this a little tricky. So the other alternative values we considered one is whole farm income, where we might take estimates of um, income per enterprise type, so the average income per hectare of wheat, um, and then map out where all the wheat is in the country, where all the other crops are, and then attach those to those individual prices. Um, you can see that as the much more volatile line. And then the very un, like very steady line is farm rent. And farm rent has been considered by SIA to be their favoured value for agriculture because it's essentially the land itself before you've added all of the uh, fertilisers and the tractors and the research that goes into providing the actual food. In that way, conceptually it works, but there are broader problems in that people invest in land for broader reasons than to produce the food. The agricultural land price is not very well related to actual income. Um, so all three prices have problems. The biggest problem with the national level is that it doesn't allow us to relate it to regulating services which people are very interested in. So for instance, pollinators are a service which regularly get valued within broader natural capital assessments, but within the national natural capital accounting perspective, they're very tricky because we need to tease out the proportion of pollinator value from the wider agricultural value. Um, so we have an agricultural value, and we need to work out how changes in pollinator numbers are affecting that overall value year to year. So if we take a farm rent approach, immediately lose the ability to do that. If we take the national approach, we can't break down the actual uh, figures enough to make sense of it. So it suggests that the only one we could use would be the whole farm income approach. But the whole farm income approach um, obviously masks a broader range of um, drivers like oil prices or food prices, which are leading to this massive volatility year to year and creates an incredibly complicated um, analytical framework. Uh, so essentially it's one where we're still working on it. I think we I'm, I'm edging towards a whole farm income, but we would need to look at multi-factor productivity in order to actually tease out every aspect of it and rely just on the bits that are related to nature, hopefully. Um, and that's the way I we would like to develop. Um, relative value is middling. I think it's relatively, uh, it's, it's around the middle of the table. Policy relevance is very high, particularly following the um, UK leaving the European Union, because we have a brand new agricultural policy. And it also is a very large proportion of land, affects every single aspect of the environment. Next slide, please. Wild fish is one where we've been more successful in moving away from a top down approach. We have uh, the first sort of picture you'll see on the top left is uh, basically the IC's rectangles, which show exactly what fish are coming from which area. So we can spatially show exactly what fish are coming from where, but obviously fish don't understand national boundaries. So we have to overlay onto that the UK's uh, exclusive economic zone, which is that blue zone in the second map. We overlay onto that, the FAO fishery areas, which are listed in the third map, and overlay and linking all of those data together enable us to link to sustainability metrics for each individual stock of uh, fish. We then link all of those um, actual landing estimates to um, estimates we have based on surveys of income per ton of each species. So we know roughly what it costs to land a ton of each species within UK waters by UK vessels. Um, and then we're able to, with all of that, we can estimate not just the overall value of the landings, 
we don't we can't just do it by spatially we can't just do it by um, species but we can also relate it to where the sustainability of each of those catches and tell you what proportion of our catch is sustainable by value and what is unsustainable there remains this large gray area at the bottom um, most of the value we are capturing within this but there's a large and important set of fisheries such as shellfish in southern england which don't follow the same kind of um, maximum sustainable yield type analysis. We need to come up with other metrics to capture those within this kind of analysis. But I think we've gone a long way and we're able to provide a far more um, compelling uh, view of the fisheries within our natural capital accounts now. We only did that in recent years. So next slide, please. Water supply is one which we rely on the residual rent approach. So we take national accounts and we approximate the profit of the industry. The problem with water in particular for that is that it's in almost all countries, I believe, a, a managed market. So there is no real price for water, such that there is a price for water. Water industry in the UK earns more money if it sells less water. It's not paid per ton of water, but per litre of water sold. As such, all we're really seeing, and because it's a regulated market, is the regulated profit required of that market. It's not necessarily very interesting. Um, for that math reason, we've explored the, the possibility of, of trying to think about different ways of thinking about the supply of water, certainly, um, and thinking about how the cost structure of that might go over time. Maybe you want to set a baseline of where in, you know, the, the, the cost of uh, getting a litre of water was and how that might be increasing with climate change. Those sorts of things might be far more interesting. We were considering looking at the broader externalities of failures to provide water and overuse of um, natural waters uh, when they're allowed to for um, because they can't get enough water normally. But we were told by the industry that essentially long term, whatever happens, they will just increase the costs. So basically, e they, they've done the cost benefit analysis. They already know that even if they needed to desalinate water, it would be cost beneficial. That's what they would do. So all we'll see over time is that profit is costs increasing, but the overall profit margin probably staying about the same and not really telling us an awful lot about the underlying drip, um, changes in our water supply. Um, so it's one that I think it still requires a great deal of theoretical thought to think about the position it plays within the national capital accounts to make them both interesting and useful uh, and broad, more broadly across the, the wider um, asset estimate. Next slide, please. Now, next on regulating services. These um, are in some ways harder because they require a great deal of technical knowledge, but in some ways they're also easier because they rely very often on remote sensing. So almost any country can get hold of remote sense data and if you can get the analysis done for you in some way you can probably produce regulating services of various kinds the next slide so we'll start with global climate regulation this is relatively simple for us um, or we used to be in that the uk has to estimate what we i don't know if they're yeah what we have to estimate our land use land change and um i was made the last bit low lucia land use land use change and forestry emissions for wider uh, reporting for to the un triple c um the big problem we have with climate regulation is that we uh, and then we basically attach that to a carbon price, which is set for us by our climate, by um, bays who have uh, responsibility for climate in the UK. The price is rather high and the values can be very high, which is why it's green. Obviously, the policy relevance is enormous, which is why that's also green. The problem I face is that within the national accounts, you can't have a, did I put my own thumb? I've, Within the national accounts, you can't have a negative value, a negative asset value. Unfortunately, the cha recent changes, not in the actual physical landscape, but changes in the way that we measure LULUCF in the UK through uh, estimating emissions and sequestration from our peatlands, means that the net position of our LULUCF is now negative. Now, 
if your position is such that you are reducing the amount of sequestration from forestry down to zero, that would definitely show up. But if you've damaged your habitat so much that it is naturally emitting and will continue to emit in perpetuity until you do something about it, then that set becomes a negative asset value, which is verboten within the national accounting structure. My personal opinion on this at the moment is that I think the, the restriction on negative asset values within the national accounts is related to standard economic theory. And when you expand standard economic theory to encompass broader externalities, you're or you're going to find an awful lot of assets which might not well might be, well be negative and to not allow them to be negative because obviously in a rational economic market that you just dump, dump the asset is to miss is confusing at least and potentially misleading so i think some change has to happen whether or not it's negative assets i don't know but i'm pushing i'm trying to find out how to cope with this better and better present the actual position we're in <laughs> because Essentially, the drying of our peat that we have 10 meters of peat in some places, vast amounts of carbon, and all of that will be released um, as uh, unless it's actually re wetted and taken care of. Uh, just to explain that picture on the left is a colleague of mine. That, um, that stick represents the loss of soil from that particular landscape over about 100 years, I think. Um, all of that was lost in that area. Okay, next slide, please. So local climate regulation, this is basically urban cooling. We do that at the moment based on a range of academic figures. So there was a literature review done to estimate the degrees cooling you would find around um, rivers, lakes and forests and the area that would cover. And then that cooling area is averaged across a broader area to estimate what the benefit would be. And those cooling effects are related to um, productivity. So we break up productivity into um, office-based work and other more physical manual labor, which is more affected by extreme heat. And on any day which is considered extreme heat, extremely hot, I think it might be over 30 degrees, um, we estimate the degrees of cooling and we estimate the benefit that would have in terms of productivity. We would like to look into health benefits that that might also relate to. But also, I think that the method we're using for urban cooling is a little crude at the moment. And I think we could do better using satellite temperature data, which obviously isn't ground temperature data, but by relating satellite temperature data to green space and relating satellite temperature data to um, on the ground actual meteorological sites should enable us to do a slightly better job of understanding how um, a clump of trees in one part of the city will affect cooling in another part of the city, whereas at the moment we're relying heavily on data that tells us what happens within a few metres of that and assuming that that sort of spreads out across the wider area. Uh, so it might not be perfect as a relatively clumsy way of doing it, but I think it's a good first attempt. Next slide, please. Air filtration is on a much stronger basis. So this is looking at where I am now, which is Chepstow on the border between England and Wales. And you can see the River Severn, if you know anything about UK geography, is that kind of light uh, green bit running down the diagonally. Um, essentially, two things we're able to do with air filtration. One is we estimate it at a very low level. So basically it looks at the amount of vegetation. We know how much um, air pollution there are in these different areas. And we have models, quite significant models, which are run occasionally for us by uh, another organization. To estimate the amount of air pollution removed, we can then relate that to standard figures on the impact on healthcare requirements, and that gives us our savings in healthcare requirements. And you can see that in my area, for some reason, the air pollution removed is lower than the UK average, probably because there's not that much air pollution where I am. But the value per person is higher than average, which I know I've always been slightly confused by, but I'm, I'm sure it's correct. Um, and we were able to do this. And another nice thing about this, because we were able to at low granularity, we were able to produce this interactive tool, which enables households and individuals to start to understand how they relate personally to their local environment. So I think people ignore the potential benefits to public engagement of national natural, national natural capital accounting. Um, next slide, please. 
Uh, let me know if I'm going too slow with these slides. I'm, I can't remember. It. I'm not paying too much attention this time. So solid waste remediation is a new one that we've been doing within the um, within the marine accounts. Um, basically, we're estimating the benefits of being able to pour um, excess uh, solid waste, which would have to be treated into the sea. Um, and assuming that the, that the, the, the wider externalities of doing that into the marine environment are not too high or at least zero because it's low enough that it's not a big problem. I'm not sure that all of that stands, but it's still a useful experimental um, service that we're looking at. I did actually manage to find an estuary, which I think my school might even be on that. That's a picture of the Ribble Estuary in Lille and St. Anne's. Very simply, essentially what we do is we try to estimate the total amounts of um, waste which is treated to secondary or tertiary levels um so basically different levels of sewage treatment and the amount which is likely to be coming out of each estuary based on um basically monitors at each of the uh, across the uk and then we relate that to the physical cost of cleaning it to the highest possible level so if it was at tertiary look at how it would have how much it would have cost to get it to, to, to sorry if it's like secondary how much it would have cost to get it to tertiary and the like so the it's a cost based um, approach, cost avoided approach. Relative value is very, very low. Policy relative, I, I think it potentially could be high, but I think most of the impacts of uh, non-point source, non source pollution are further upstream. So it's when it doesn't reach the sea and it um, pollutes the rivers themselves or pollutes a bay which um, is not flushed properly, such as Pool Harbour. Thanks. Next slide, please. Uh, noise attenuation is done fairly well. So essentially, we have a number of GIS maps which estimate a number of mapping tools which estimate where trees are, where the noise is. We have a good noise map, um, but that's not repeated very often. And then we look, and then we basically have a modeling tool which looks at how that noise would have been attenuated by the vegetation around it. The, um, there has been updates to that modeling. Uh, so one tricky aspect of this is that we, there was um, some updates to the attenuation model. And that was applied to Manchester alone. And now I'm struggling to get those people to repeat that for the whole of the UK. So finding time with people to run things on their servers when you don't have full control of uh, all of the data which you're trying to run is uh, a challenge that I'm facing at the moment. But that's basically how we do it. And there's um, a basically a kind of annoyance value which we apply to it. Relative value is very low and it's probably, it might even be lower than that. Policy relevance can be reasonably high of noise, um, but I don't know how much, um, but I've not seen much require, require many requests for it. Next slide. Flood protection is one that's trickier and I think being built on. So there are a couple of different approaches. One is from our forestry commission. They estimate the benefits of um, woodland roots, uh, but they tend to, that it's, it's not too bad in that they've estimated where there is flood risk um, and, and actual pressure and where they're likely to be providing benefits. And then they do a cost-based approach. So they basically say, well, we're storing this much, we're providing this much excess potential storage. And if you were gonna provide a kind of built alternative in terms of reservoirs, which you could take extra water at certain times of the year, um, then it would cost this much. And that's the cost basis that they're doing that on. Um, internally, we're trying to do something with salt marshes, and so basically less kind of internal terrestrial flash flooding, more um, inward tidal flood protection from salt marshes. Um, we've mapped where all our salt marshes, which is quite good. We can map what the um, buildings and farmland is in shore, so we can, we can cost what would be damaged if it were flooded inland of that. Um, the trickier aspects are one, estimating how far inshore the flood defence would run. So we can do that a little bit topogra topogra yeah, topographically. And the other is um, teasing apart a, a cost basis, essentially. So essentially, we don't know what the risk profile will be. We don't know if um, removing that salt marsh would take you from a, say, one in 50 year flood to a one in 100 year flood. Uh, but we have some ideas of how we might do that in terms of modeling. So looking across the country at different places that look the same, but do or don't have salt marsh. And there are risk, uh, uh, flood risk maps that are already at those sites based on empirical data and also modeling. And using those, a mixture of the two, we'd hope to try and tease them apart in the next few years. But yes, 
one where we've had made some progress, but we're still working on it a little bit. I think the, the forestry research, I think are very happy with their kind of forest based woodland ones. We're not very happy with the salt marsh ones yet, but I think it is one where there is interest in us pressing forward with it. And it's one of those services which people tend to assume might be very large. I'm, I'm not so certain that it will be particularly massive, but it, I think it will be significant and important part of the overall flood defense uh, strategy as climate imp increases. Next slide, please. Uh, cultural services. Um, I don't know why I put William. I was thinking I was just rushing to put find the pictures. Uh, cultural services often, I think, differing to uh, provisioning and regulating where usually I think most nations could find some data to do a, a reasonable job um, if they've got a little bit of investment. Um, cultural services, the biggest problem with them is if the data isn't there, then you're looking at having to take on a long term cost because you can't really provide cultural services uh, estimates without survey data. Without the survey data, you're completely lost. And survey data is a long term, whereas the others, you could put some short term investment into developing methods and initial tools and then potentially long term costs aren't too high. I think the potential cost of running cultural services is you are committing to doing some surveys for a very long time. So next slide, we'll talk about those in a little bit of detail. So recreation, relative value is one of our highest. I think the reason why the relative value of, recreate, of outdoor recreation is very high is because whilst in the, room, the rest of our um, services, we tend to rely certainly in provisioning on wholesale and the most wholesale possible. So remember for timber, we use the um, standing overbar price so it's a very cheap price before any added value. The relative, the price that we set for recreation is essentially a retail price. It's the point at which individuals engage with the, um, in the, with the outdoors. In the UK, we, in England, we have a long running survey, which used to be called MENE, meaning, um, and it's been changed to PANS. So changes in survey basis has been causing headaches for us. Um, but it's a long running survey which looks specifically at the out outdoor outdoor engagement. So we have a good way of estimating the numbers of people going into the outdoors, which habitats they're engaging with, how much they're spending on transport. And so we have the perfect way into estimating, at least for England. The broader difficulties we have is the devolved approach to the environment, particularly in the UK, means that in Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland, the data provision is more patchy. Wales and Scotland have done some data, uh, have done some surveys, but they don't. Uh, and I think Scotland does now have a long running survey, but it doesn't seem to run every year. Um, and so we have to slowly piece together a picture with bits of other countries and then interpreting, uh, basically looking at the bits of data we have from those other countries and using the sort of long running data in England to fill in the gaps across the nations. And even then, those data largely rely on day trips and they weren't capturing longer term tourism data. Um, so we've had to, in recent years, started taking GB tourism data and trying to adapt that to fill in the broader gaps. The GB tourism data set is, because it's done for the tourism industry, a much bigger survey, much bigger um, sample size, a lot more certainty that it will continue for, probably into perpetuity still have problems with changes in survey basis. They've changed three times, uh, twice now, I think, in the last couple of years. And they're not specifically for the outdoors. So the way that we have to interpret it is slightly tricky. We have to make some value judgments uh, in order to make use of that data. But we are now at a position where we can capture the vast majority of outdoor trips and the value is reasonably high. Uh, next slide, please. Obviously, COVID has also caused us a massive headache with that. Um, the other aspect and uh, of, of culture which we capture is visual amenity services. So basically how attractive the outdoors look. And we're able to capture that through hedonic pricing of house prices. So we had um, a large uh, house selling website sell, gave us all of that, gave the pub, they gave the government all of their data for a number of years. And we were able to use that to estimate both the value of being near to a park, so that added to our recreation value, um, the sorts of sites where 
there wouldn't be very high travel cost, but your home might be worth more because you're near an out, near a park, being able to put, add, add that value. And we're able to look in, into the details of the house and see if it states that there is a you know, view of a lake or a river or the sea or a park and add the price that that would add to it. So essentially what we do is we take those houses, all of the details about them, stick them in a model, a relatively good model. Uh, it's a kind of um, AI model. And um, from that, pull out the price of recreation, the price of uh, visual amenities separately. A uh, struggle we face with that is the data that was originally given to us was, for three, was only up to 2016. We have had no repeat since then. We've now had to shift to government-based sources of data, which covers vast majority of these things, but does not include descriptions of the house as you would find within the Zoopla data, within the house selling data. Um, so in order to get visual amenity services long-term, we're going to have to switch to another model where we take a topographic model of the of the of the nation. Um, we basically map all of the households, all of the green space, and estimate. We, I think there are tools which should enable to estimate whether that house at a certain height should be able to see the green spaces and blue spaces and seas that we've uh, um, that we've spotted. That will be computationally. Complex uh, and difficult, but I think it's one that our um, data scientists are excited to have a crack at. Um, and it will give us a long term, absolutely viable way of estimating these values. So I think they're of broader interest. Thanks. Uh, next slide. Education is less one. We don't have this yet either. Um, there's a large number of providers of outdoor education in the UK. Those aren't fully captured within the outdoor recreation surveys. And I've been engaging with all of the different providers. Some are NGOs, some are small government bodies, uh, some are private providers of outdoor education. There's a large number of them and they sit in lots of different groups. And I'm working with them to try and encourage them to set up an open data platform, which would enable them to capture how many trips are happening and the kinds of, and some of the data which enable me to produce an education survey. So in that case, it's one of uh, basically a kind of PR exercise with the providers of these sort of things. They look, I think it would be of use to you as an industry to have these data. Um, I would provide technical assistance or advice on how to do that, but I'm not going to go any further than that. But hopefully through doing that, we can develop a data set which would enable us to present education as a further cultural service in the UK. Uh, next slide. That's, uh, I mentioned at the beginning, we have a small team but we rely on a very large number of organizations. These are the organizations that have helped us directly and, and, I'm, and I'm missing quite a few. And I know that because we have a list of all of our data sets. We rely on something like 275 different data sets or data points or have at different points. And those come from around 60 different organizations. An awful lot of the time and energy that goes into producing these accounts is essentially, and reason, the reason why it takes 10 years is because the data are, distributed very widely. They take a lot of time to understand and make use of and turn into something that's useful for your own purposes. And that is where I think anyone starting from scratch is going to end up spending most of their resources is engaging, depending on how complex the data environment is in your country, engaging with them to understand and develop your data sets. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you very much. I think it was around half now. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Adam. That was uh, quite an insightful presentation. I hope everybody now has a, a good sense of uh, the various uh, services that you can go about measuring. And, and Adam provided great insights on some of the uh, challenges, but also some of the impressive visuals that have been uh, put together by uh, by the colleagues in the UK to measure all these various uh, services. Let me stop sharing the screen here. Uh, Adam, uh, I think I, I, uh, colleagues, please feel free as usual to write your questions into the chat. Uh, also, if you would like to take the floor to ask uh, questions directly to Adam in Russian or in English, uh, please do so. Uh, just raise your hand and we'll pass, uh, pass the floor to you. Uh, Adam, uh, while colleagues maybe type their questions or, or um, think of what uh, questions to ask you, I, had a, I, I wrote a many, many questions, but let me just ask a few questions that I think would be uh, interesting to the colleagues here. You mentioned uh, 
that there are a lot of tools that you have developed uh, as part of analyzing all these various data sources. Uh, do you think those tools uh, are, are flexible enough that they can be utilized by other countries or they're so specific to the UK context uh, that, uh, uh, you know, their usability for in, in, in other countries might be might be more limited, let's say. I think there's uh, two answers. One is theoretically, I think a large number of them would be reusable. So um, for instance, urban cooling, the basic approach, you could easily build something that would be reusable in other countries. Um, so most of the regulating services, I think our approaches could be mapped across. The, the challenge though, is that, and it's one of the bugbears I've got, and it's one of the things I'm having to fix now is that when you're trying to build something from scratch, the easiest thing to do is to do it really quickly in Excel. And you end up kind of iteratively building it as you work out what you need to do and what you need to put where, and you end up with large numbers of worksheets and all sorts of complicated things going on. And that causes two headaches. One is obviously it's not transferable because it's hardly it's quite difficult for us to explain it to new starters because they're quite complicated yes. Excel spreadsheets. You certainly can't send it externally, and also it makes quality assurance an absolute nightmare. So uh, one of the pro problem it's a bit like you know just because we were trying to build things from scratch, we ended up with large numbers of quite messy Excel spreadsheets. We certainly couldn't just hand. I'm really embarrassed to hand them to other people. They work, um, but we are basically trying to find time to produce our accounts, develop our accounts, and also find a little bit of time to turn them, to switch them into Python, which I've got um, a colleague of mine is gonna try and spend the run up into Christmas doing that for a few of our services. Um, when that's done, I think the way we've mapped it, certainly, like, certainly the methods could be used, but I just don't think we've built it in such a way thinking, okay, well, how could you transplant this into yep. Portugal? Um, I, I just don't, yeah, we certainly haven't done that. Um, and a lot of the data, I mean, even in, even with urban cooling, you've got to do the mapping and the mapping is always different in different countries. So I think we could do, we could provide the kind of support which would speed people up in building their own. But yeah, I think, yeah, because we're not using, not, we're not using kind of an international remote sensed habitat map. If we were doing that, if everyone was using a sort of standardized habitat map for the whole world, you could probably have a crack at it. But even there, there's always going to be someone sort of like, for instance, for urban issues, there's always interest in, say, small standing trees, and they're not going to show up on your kind of international and remote sense data. Yep. You need to have somebody else spending a bit of time developing one for your, for your area. Um, so it's, yes, and I think theoretically you could do it. We haven't done it in such a way where you could hand over code to anyone. Um, and even if we had tried to, I think because the data sources are so different, it would be tricky, but we could certainly give someone a big leg up to do it much quicker themselves. Yeah. I mean, I, I think obviously people can learn for some of some of the challenges you faced and how, how you dealt with those, because some of those probably would be cross-cutting. To link with the data issue, I think the next thing that might be more relevant to, to colleagues also uh, is, you mentioned obviously you're working with a lot of partners and different data sources and bringing all that data sources to get all those data sources together is quite quite challenging. Uh, what would be some advice for people that might just start in some of the areas that you mentioned uh, as they start setting things things up, uh, you know, with databases or GIS or whatnot? What would be sort of one or two major pitfalls that people should watch out for and try to try to avoid as they set things up uh, uh, in their countries? So, in terms of the data management, um, yes, I can give sort of again. I can give sort of two answers. Um, one from the natural capital team's perspective. Fortunately, most of the data sets that we're getting are open data. So we're able to just kind of download. So we don't have problems of sort of delivery or anything like that too much. There's a handful where we do have kind of personal relationships. I think the, again, a slightly had that the way we've run that is largely kind of long-term relationships. We've got a couple of members of staff who've been here around for a long time. So they're they know to do that and they do it at that time of year. To try to overcome that, what we have done and the reason why I can say we have 275 data sets is that the person who has those personal relationships, I asked her to basically work across the team and compile literally every data set we have, where they come from, which, which of our um, uh, publications they go into, such that if everyone dropped dead tomorrow and they had to replace our team, someone could come in and find that data, you know, and they could, and they could replace it. Um, other problems, I think, uh, what more formal data sharing is also is a bigger problem. So. We, I worked for the ONS on our kind of data sharing team, 
And I think the main thing with that is where we had to get data share. Unfortunately, because it's most of our data sets are also entirely non-confidential. So because we work in an environment, we're not working with individual data. It's relatively simple. We're not working with any personal data. Um, if you ever had to do that, I think the main lesson I've had from having to and try and get long-term formal data shares of more commercial data or the like is that it always takes longer than you think it's going to take. So if you're going to start one of these projects and think, right, well, we need a bunch of um, council tax data, uh, uh, commercial tax data to estimate some aspect of this, to estimate our renewable energy accounts or something, we want to look at the tax data to get it, whatever they want to do. I would add like very long periods of time depending on the country though but that's been our experience is that it takes a long time to set up those sort of formal data sharing agreements um so there's two kind of sides of the we, because we're in the um official because we're in the statistical office of the uk we do have a bunch of people who do that kind of those data sharing yep. agreements there's a wider bureaucracy that sits with that and a bunch of things that sit there and then i've got my own little team which do our own thing um mm -hmm. and when we shift into the position of having to deal with the broader data sharing and all the kind of formal aspects of it, everything gets much slower and yep. harder to do. Well understood. I think colleagues understand that as well. A question from the chat from our colleagues in, in Turkmenistan, uh, Adam. I think uh, they're interested on how can, can we motivate our governments to begin working on, on SIA. So what are some of the things maybe that you can share as far as what has worked well uh, in the UK to to get this work done and get buy-in from uh, uh, hmm. folks in the in the policy space in particular, um, you know, I think you had some very, uh, you know, uh, very good communication there, as you mentioned as well, with a, a very interesting graphs, very, uh, very succinct messages that resonate with people that are not uh, technical in this space. But more broadly, what would you recommend as far as motivating our administrators to start working on the SCA and I think we'll we'll leave that as the last question for for this session yeah I think um what started it in the UK was in 2010 I think you'll remember there was the the Sarkozy government commissions the beyond GDP work um and that that was very very influential I think our own incoming prime minister had an interest in beyond GDP and that was what stemmed the, that's what kind of pushed the initial drive to putting some resource into this I think beyond that, there's a number of ways in which the natural capital accounts are useful, some of which are very traditional, I think we would expect anyway, and some of which are less so. And I'll name some of the ones I think are less, I think public engagement is really big. And I don't think, I think the public tend not to understand the environment that well. They don't understand the variety of ways in which it can affect them. And natural capital is a really useful lens for grabbing people to say, look, this is keeping you healthier because all these trees around you are keeping and, and we can show you not just that but how is that looking in your environment how is look at that looking at your grandmother's neighborhood and could yours be better or the load of places where you could be putting more vegetation you know answering those questions and providing that kind of um interactive that enables people to engage really detail in, in a way that is understandable to their to them with these complex concepts is a really valuable tool of being able to do it at the national scale because then you can do the grant if you can produce the granular data you've got a really broad rich data set for get that kind of engagement that builds up into local authorities where local authorities don't necessarily need really detailed cost benefit analysis to make their cases They've been asking us for data on the value of their local parks because you know they have budget constraints and they need to make arguments to these parks when they're putting constraints on broader social requirements for their for their for their money. Um, and so they come to us and say, well, what was the air pollution removal values for us? And just that headline figure at the local area is really useful for them. Those those headline figures have been used in Parliament. I think they're quite used in policy policy documents as well. So at national level. They have been used in Scottish Parliament and the like, just to kind of give, they give a flavour of the importance or what's going on in an environment. I think, though, the other aspect and where I'd like to take the national, I think those kind of headline figures only take you so far. And I think you need, I think I talked a little bit about the, 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 the problems you face when you only do top down and that you can't provide analysis and value added. And I think if you run the accounts for a number of years, you're going to get those questions. It's like, what if I do this? Or what if this changes? And how is that going to change? So I think um, longer, if you're thinking about a longer term life for them, rather than saying, well, let's produce a couple of accounts, show the rough scale of these values, and that'll do, then you really need to be thinking about developing detailed modeling. And that's what we're trying to do so that you can ask answer actual policy questions 
uh, and support policy on a wide range. Because again, it's one of those things where, you know, the environment is increasingly seeping into, it's becoming relevant and understood by a broader range of people. It used to be your environment department would do all the environment stuff and everyone else would largely try and ignore it because it was just something the other guys did. Yep. Whereas your, you know, your transport department, your, um, uh, your health department, all of them need to understand the, envir the environment and natural capital accounting is a way that takes all these complex things and throws them through a sausage maker, which makes them uh, understandable and uh, you know, without completely simplif oversimplifying, it gives you this broad range of tools which enables all of these different uh, policy departments to understand how their decisions are affecting the a broader range of environmental things. I think that's important. The last one, which I think is really interesting but gets ignored, is that we talked about a little bit about the complexity of the data environment for the environment for, for the data environment for the environment. Um, socioeconomic data can also be complex, and having we usually often within your um, statistical authority a team who have a broad and shallow understanding of the environment data, the social data, and your economic data provides a really useful nexus for doing some social research. So, for instance, during the COVID. Um, during the early stages of the COVID pandemic, there was some concern that air pollution might be a driver in uh, mortality rates. And because of our understanding of all of those data sets and because of our access to a wide range of data sets within the Office of National Statistics and for the set of skills, understanding and access to data meant that we were the ones asked to do that piece of analysis because we were most rapidly able to provide it using the best possible data. And so developing a team but developing a natural capital accounts team also develops an awful lot of um, skills uh, yeah. within your Human capacity, department, which, which, which are transferable and capacity, which I think go beyond that, beyond the kind of strict natural capital accounting framework into a broader kind of environmental slash socioeconomic nexus to answer those kind of questions. Like you're going to be the guys who can, who understand how to link those data, who understand what the issues are going to be with those data to be cautious about the implications all that i think there's really st strong benefits yep of producing these kinds of accounts um and we we did a few other bits and pieces during covid so we looked at um access to green space obviously when people were locked down we were able to provide some data on who could and couldn't get access to a local park that's the thing who had gardens who didn't and how the social breakdown of that was so we were able to provide kind of rapid response useful data to um, a disaster, which you wouldn't necessarily think that a natural capital team would be the ones doing that kind of work as well as ever all the rest of the things. Yeah, no, thank you, Adam. I think I think this trade-off sort of analysis and making these decisions requires all the inputs from the other players as well. Now people understand that, uh, you know, it's, it's not just uh, the silo approach, but we need to think about uh, trade-offs and different uses, competing uses across different uh, ecosystems and, and whatnot. Uh, Adam, thank you so very much. Uh, I think this was quite insightful uh, for, for everybody to hear, one, what the various uh, uh, services are and how you have gone about in the UK to measure these services. And I think, you know, uh, it was quite neat. I'll just mention quickly, I think you said uh, the, the, you know, the air filtration and putting a figure to it on what, you know, health savings are associated with good air filtration is something that's very easy. And I hope people catch on to that. And, and that's the type of analysis and the type of opportunity that can be mentioned to these senior uh, staff and, and decision makers to say, look, we need to invest in this because we'll have uh, good results that we can actually base decisions on, on those. So, uh, Adam, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate the time. Uh, and I'm sure we'll see you soon again in, in other activities. So thank you from, from uh, our team for, for your presentation. Uh, colleagues, uh, uh, may you. I suggest we take a, a two minute break uh, so that uh, we have time for our last session of our, our webinar series. I see Alessio is here already. Uh, so we will start in, in two minutes. Uh, maybe you stretch, uh, grab, grab a cup of tea or, or coffee, and we come back in a couple of minutes with a final session uh, for, for today. Uh, so two minute break at, uh, so that we, so that we keep, uh, keep to time and uh, uh, try to wrap things up uh, at, at the planned time. Uh, probably a good idea for us to start uh, again with uh, another interesting and uh, timely topic here. Uh, so we have focused now on extent, condition. You heard Adam talk about services in great detail. And I hope 
some of the work that the UK has been doing has given you some ideas of what are the important ecosystem services in the context of your country and things that you should be thinking about. And I think also the other thing to keep in mind is that a lot of work has been uh, done in this space. So uh, if you need support, uh, there is uh, many good experts out there and we'd be happy to, to facilitate that interaction and discussion. Now for this last session of, uh, of our webinar series, uh, we're happy to have colleagues from, um, from the Basque Center from, from Climate Change, and we have Alessio here, I see already, and Stefano as well. Uh, they'll be leading us through the next uh, hour or so uh, uh, through a discussion uh, of, of ARIES, uh, which is a new, uh, new tool that they'll talk about more in detail. I will not try to... Uh, uh, um, Try to try to explain it because they they'll do a much better job, obviously, than I will. But before turning the floor over to to Alessio and Stefano, let me quickly introduce them uh, both. Uh, so uh, Alessio uh, is a manager, project manager on natural capital accounting at the Basque Center for Climate Change. Uh, he holds a master's of science in economics and has worked as an economic and financial analyst for for several years in the energy sector. Uh, supporting the commercial and contractual negotiations of projects, as well as modeling and conducting financial uh, screenings. He has also completed a postgraduate course uh, with MIT uh, uh, Portugal. We also have Stefano uh, Baldi. Uh, Stefano is the uh, managing director for ARIES. Uh, he's a research fellow at uh, the Basque Center for, for Climate Change. Uh, since he completed his master's in environmental economics, he has studied uh, human natural system interactions uh, from a holistic perspective where theories and approaches from both the social and environmental scientific practices are integrated to better represent behavior, special dependencies, and temporal dynamics. Uh, so we are very keen to have them both. They both work uh, with... Uh, uh, Fernanda Villa, who is uh, uh, the lead researcher for the uh, 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 Basque Center for Climate Change. I hope I got that, that right. Uh, Fernando has been a uh, great contributor to the advances in the SEA over the past uh, decade or so now. So this has been uh, good, good ongoing work for, for, for some time. Uh, I hope the session will provide you some good insights on ARIES and, and also data interoper interoperability. So uh, Alessio Stefano, uh, if, you can, if we can wrap things up in about 50 minutes or so to give colleagues a chance to ask some questions towards the end as well, that would be great. 45 minutes or so, if that's, uh, that's, uh, 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 that would be good. I leave it off to you now. So please take over and uh, 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 I don't know who's gonna go first and, and whatnot, but uh, I, I trust that all will be in order here. So Alessio will go first, but uh, his audio is not okay. Can you yes. hear me now? Yeah, yes. yes. Wow. And can you see my presentation? Yes, yes. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, I will now give a quick introduction of the Iris4C Explorer, which is the application that we've been developing with, uh, in collaboration with the United Nations Statistical Division and uh, UNEP. Uh, Alessio, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, we can see your your screen, your your yourself on the screen. So if you can just share the presentation rather than, as much as we would love to see you, uh, I think it might, it might be good to see the presentation. <laughs> Inside, I will try to share this again. Can you see my uh, yes. the presentation now? Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Great. Thank you. So, uh, what is uh, Arias? Arias stands for Artificial Intelligence for Environment and Sustainability is a modeling technology and can be thought rather than a single model, a collection of uh, model and specific programs and application. 
is based on artificial intelligence, particularly on uh, machine reasoning. And uh, can be thought as a collection of data models that are uh, cataloged and related across different uh, scientific disciplines. And this allows the different data models to be used uh, together. And depending on which data models are most appropriate, appropriate for a specific uh, context, context um, the system will uh, return uh, the most appropriate answer. So artificial intelligence is used to determine uh, the most uh, fit and uh, appropriate answer for a user's query. Uh, the artificial intelligence is based on reasoning algorithm, decision rules, multidisciplinary semantic, and open data models as well as, as an open uh, source and software. And all these make areas a fast, fair, multidisciplinary modeling environment. And uh, I'll, we will explain later what uh, fair means and why artificial intelligence uh, is so important. So we believe that often government face very high barrier to uh, produce uh, ecosystem accounts. And this is mainly due to the uh, large amount of data that is needed to produce and compile uh, these accounts. Uh, there is also, this is also a process that is very time uh, consuming and usually very slow exercise. And ecosystem accounting makes use of biophysical models, which by definition requires uh, a lot of technical expertise. All this is not easy to uh, overcome, and we believe that implementing a system based on uh, a fair system, so findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data and models, would really benefit the whole ecosystem accounting uh, community. So this was a brief description of what Aries is, and now we're going to talk about what can be used for, and we're going to see a particular application. So Aries can be used for virtually any uh, special explicit analysis, special economic evaluation of ecosystem services, conservation planning, special policy planning, forecasting for change in provision of ecosystem services, but today we're gonna to focus on the natural capital accounting. And for this, we produce uh, a ad hoc application, which is the Arius Forcia. And we're gonna focus on Arius Forcia Explorer, which is the interface that is used by non-technical users to access this uh, information. This uh, application is based on the Arius technology and is thought to compile automatically uh, accounts that are consistent with the CI ecosystem accounting methodology. Uses global and free available data, mostly based on uh, remote sensing, and it can generate accounts for any user-specified terrestrial area in the world. So any geographic area uh, can be um, the context of your analysis. These uh, results are rapidly computed using uh, an account online. So the only thing that is necessary is just a web browser and it's freely accessible uh, by everyone, both individual or institutions and national statistical office. Uh, we'll see more in detail later, but I anticipate that the system automatically generates a comprehensive uh, uh, report and full documentation on all the uh, results and the method and the data used to, uh, to obtain those results. Uh, so this is based on the system of environmental economic uh, accounting and uh, we have ecosystem extent, ecosystem condition and ecosystem service, uh, both modeled in uh, uh, physical and uh, monetary terms. And we haven't modeled so far the ecosystem uh, asset account, but all the other uh, components are uh, currently covered. Uh, this is a quick overview of the main outputs in which we have uh, a tables, which usually uh, identify more uh, the statistical part of our uh, output. And then we have also maps to instead have a more visual um, 
uh, the idea of the results and also this is the part that uh, express how uh, the special explicit analysis has been uh, has been computed uh, we also have um, other outputs to document the results particularly the report the resource section and the data flow diagram and i'm going to speak uh, about this more uh, in details uh, soon with my demonstration we have two different interfaces. Faces one is for uh, technical users in which one is able to contribute and semantically annotate new data and model, which then become available for reuse by the whole scientific uh, community and the all integrated modeling uh, community that is, uh, yeah, that is our community. And we also have, as I mentioned, the uh, explorer that is a uh, uh, thought for non technical users in which anyone uh, can access and uh, run a particular uh, model in uh, a matter of minutes and uh, this is accessible simply by a web browser because it's based on uh, the, the cloud based data uh, that is served through the bc3 center bc3 stands for vast center for climate change Uh, now I'll start a quick demonstration, but I would also like to invite you to also check this other uh, link that we make available to understand the work that we're carrying forward and how this tool can be uh, used. In this case, we have our web page, we have an access guide in which we explain how to access the system and how to use it. And then we also have several um, registration that I think might be useful, like a workshop that is given during the EU Green Week and uh, the launch itself of the application that happened in the end of March of uh, this year. And then here there is access to our integrated modeling uh, page. And, uh, oops. Um, This is how we access the uh, application. I just, sorry, I need to switch the screen. Um, excuse me, are you able to see Yes. The case part, perfect. Right, okay, thank you very much. So just one moment. So uh, as you can see, IS for CIA is accessible to everyone registered in our integrated modeling app. And the only requirement is a stable internet connection. So there is the K Explorer, and then there is ir for cia Explorer. The difference between the two We'll see this in a minute. Is now we are accessing the application, and the general KLab interface works as a normal um, interactive map in which the user can move around the globe and uh, zoom uh, out and zoom in a particular geographic area. What sits on top of the map interface is uh, the Iris for C application, which is this panel on the left and this here at the top of the screen. Uh, this was specifically developed by our team in collaboration with the United Nations and UNEP. And uh, this was done to kickstart natural capital accounting uh, around the world. All the accounts are compiled following the system of environmental economic accounting, ecosystem accounting methodology. But other application could be easily created to serve different purposes and assessment. And actually, Ares for CIA uh, can already be used to compile other CIA related outputs such as the Sustainable Development Goals or the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity Frameworks uh, Indicator. And I can show later an example of this. Uh, and I'll give a quick demonstration of how to use the application to compile an ecosystem uh, service account. 
uh, the first step is to select the spatial temporal context of your analysis. There is a first dimension that is a spatial dimension, and there are three main um, options from the drop down menu, which are uh, map boundaries, the default option, and uses the whole area shown uh, in, the, in the screen. So it would run the model on this rectangle. Then we have the administrative. Uh, region option, which is most interesting for natural capital accounting, because consider the greater uh, the greatest uh, administrative unit or entity within the area observed in the map. So you can see that as I uh, scroll in uh, and out, the system uh, select a different uh, context according to, uh, sorry, it takes uh, a bit to react. So this is what I'm talking about. If I zoom in, uh, this select automatically uh, the greatest context uh, in, uh, in the map shown. And then we have the third, that is the river basin, which instead would base the, um, the results of the accounts on watersheds. There is actually a fourth, which is one that I also want to show you, and is to directly type uh, the name of the context within what we call the knowledge bar. And in this case, I'm going to pick Moscow. And as you can see, sorry about this. Uh, the system select this area. Uh, the second dimension that we're going to take in account is granularity. And in this box, uh, the user can select a resolution of preference for the analysis. In this case, you're going to leave the default option and you're gonna, also going to lock this special resolution. So even if we move around, this uh, parameter won't change. Uh, the third dimension of our context is uh, uh, when, so it's the time. And uh, there are two options. We can have a static analysis based on a single year, and then we simply uncheck this button. Otherwise, if we want a multi-year analysis, we can select this. Let's run, for instance, from 2015 to 2018 in the area of the state of Moscow. And then let's look which are uh, the, the second uh, section, that is the selection of model, the study setup. And the user simply check off the accounts they want to see compiled, and the system automatically generate them according to the context previously set. In case more accounts are uh, selected, uh, those are calculated following the chronological order of selection. And once one model is computed, the system moves to the next one in the queue until all the queried accounts are uh, compiled. There are three main groups of account, extent account, condition account, which is a slightly different because the user must also select uh, which are the ecologic variables on which you want to see uh, the uh, different condition accounts compiled. And as you can see, as soon as you select one of these, uh, also this output becomes available. And then we have ecosystem uh, service accounts. And uh, that computes, are computed in both physical and uh, monetary uh, terms. Uh, monetary values are available for most of the ecosystem services current available in the application. And so far, we have crop provisioning by ecosystem contribution, uh, crop provisioning by pollination contribution, climate store, uh, climate, uh, global climate regulations of carbon storage, sediment uh, regulation, and then we also have monetary value for crop provisioning, crop provisioning with pollination, and carbon. Now, I'm going to start running one of these uh, uh, models. Uh, I thought about running, for instance, leaf area index, and we can select NDVI for both ecosystem condition variable account and ecosystem condition indicator. And as you can see, the system is already com starting computing and compiling automatically all the inputs needed to compute uh, the model. Since this is going to take some time, I would like now to move to uh, another uh, example, which I've already run previously. So 
tries to make this fast and just give me one second. So this is an example of uh, models run in the Uzbekistan context from still from 2015 to 2018 at 750 meters of uh, resolution. And what happens when the an output is available in areas that it shows automatically in this area. In this case, we are looking at the table uh, outcome. And in this case, I had uh, made a run on uh, extent account on the net change and also on the Lava Clamor regulation physical supply. And as you can see, these are uh, the results. There's the results for the first year, second year, and then the net change, and the same uh, for the carbon model. All these results can be downloaded as table in PDF once we open them. We have here the results. And uh, the same is true for maps, for which we have another section. So it now needs to load, but basically, as you can see, those three maps were computed when um, querying these accounts. And we have uh, the ecosystem types map, the vegetation uh, carbon storage, and uh, the carbon organic mass. And also, these are uh, downloadable uh, by simply clicking on this uh, button on top of here on maps. Um, we also have uh, another section that is the one related to the resource used in the data. And this uh, uh, resource indicates the geographic coverage area, the year, the version, the provenance, and include a link to the regional uh, source if available, and the short description of what has been used. And as you can see, all the input used are listed here. Uh, there is also the report. There is another section automatically generated by the system that summarizes the information by building a narrative containing an introduction, methods, uh, results, and discussion around the output computed. Um, the report is also downloadable by simply clicking on this button. And you can download, uh, for instance, save it as a PDF or directly print it. Uh, to provide even more transparency, there is a fourth section that is the data flow viewer. There is a diagram showing in a graph, in a graphic way, all the combination of the modeling components used to obtain intermediary, intermediary and final output. Uh, the green box highlights a resource used. So, for instance, in this case, we are looking at average temperatures, or we can use the example, of, for instance. Uh, the elevation. Uh, in light three, there are processes and uh, classification, such as the use of lookup tables, uh, in which inputs are uh, matched to a certain output according to the model need. Like in this case, for instance, here we have uh, the land cover composition, uh, and the lookup table takes into account. Uh, the land cover and then other ecological variable to identify a particular ecosystem type. In the darker gray uh, boxes, we instead have uh, operations such as transformation, con conversion, or uh, arithmetic operation that are taken by the system. So as you can see, every single step of the calculation is fully documented and uh, traceable. I would like now to go back to the other modeling. As you can see, this is now have been, have been completed. And so the system moves automatically to the same area, which are also, I'll show you some results. These are for Moscow. And uh, you can also um, observe each of the modeling component individually. So for instance, in this case, I'm going to select the land cover, and we can also download uh, this uh, sorry, this component individually. As you can see, now it's computing and it's producing this. Uh, now we're gonna I'm gonna 
open this to show you how this is, uh, that this can be easily open in uh, any uh, QGIS or uh, similar application. And as you can see, the results here are available. Now, this is uh, slightly coarse because we have done it at 150 meters, and I'm sure that for something that is uh, run on this uh, specific on such a small region, to be probably we would need uh, higher resolution data. But um, as you said, like the our purpose with this work was to create a tool that would allow every country on Earth to start compiling accounts and as such we rely on uh, global data. We're aware that for regional uh, analysis, uh, data with high resolution and better precision can be used. And with the UN, we are actually working on a strategy to make as easy as possible for data providers such as NSOs or institutions to integrate this information into, into our system. I also want to stress how we keep working and plan to constantly expand and improve on the current offer of our uh, models and, uh, and accounts. And I think Aris is a very powerful tool and there is virtually no limitation to what can be modeled in the platform as long as all the modeling components are uh, integrated correctly in the system. So we're looking forward to start collaborating with uh, uh, your community on this. And now I will also uh, leave the floor to my colleague Stefano, who will discuss uh, interoperability and uh, present our strategy to, to achieve that. Thanks, Alessio. Uh, in, if anybody has a, a question, uh, uh, can also write it in the chat or can we can take a question now if, uh, if it's relevant. Uh, uh, maybe one quick uh, question, yes, Stefano, yes. that our uh, colleague sure. uh, Naira from Armenia put in the chat. Uh, yes, you are, Alessio. Uh, what resolutions uh, uh, have the satellite maps? Uh, yeah. uh, so what resolution is available, I guess, for, for you know, some of these? Uh, what is the range of resolutions that uh, is available? Yeah, so it depends really on the on the input data because every every input has a different uh, resolution. Like for example, elevation is ninety meters, and land cover we are using uh, CCI from uh, the European Special Agency uh, at the global level. Also for Europe we have Corin, so they come with different resolutions. But uh, if I remember well, CCI is uh, three hundred huh? meters. Three hundred okay. meters. Okay. Yes. Uh, so, so we are not bounded to one particular resolution. Basically, we can take uh, any type of data at any resolution, and we and we integrate uh, the data in a in a seamless uh, computational workflow. Obviously, the output is bounded to the type of input that uh, you provide. And uh, as we said, the idea is to provide a default. Um, using global data, what is available there uh, at the public level. And, um, and then countries have their own data that they might want to use. And so for that, we are working uh, with single countries, with national statistical offices. Uh, we have 10 case studies around the world, in Africa, in Latin America, in Europe. Um, and basically, we are helping the national statistical offices to, to use their own data in this type of... Um, analysis yeah so i hope i hope i answered this question and i i i can move to the presentation but before that uh let me share the screen i will share all the screen but then i move okay perfect 
Okay, so uh, this is the website where you can actually access the uh, web application that uh, Alessandro, uh, Alessio was describing. So you can go to sia.un.org or you can also type in any web search, Aries for Sia, you will likely arrive to this page and then you have this link, web browser, and this will take you directly to the web application. Uh, and probably if you're not registered yet, you will have to create your... Uh, user profile so username and password and uh, and then you are uh, good to go and to and and to basically you, we are happy if you can if you want to try it now let me start with the presentation and feel free to interrupt me if you have uh, questions um what i want to talk about uh, with you today is kind of a to complement what we what was said until now is the is the issue of interoperability, uh, and interoperability is defined as the ability of data and tools from non-cooperating resources to integrate or work together with minimal effort. So, from the definition, you might understand that is a is a very important uh, issue because for especially for natural capital accounting. Um, you need to put together data from different sources um, and also different kinds of formats. Like I think the, the greatest challenge that we had uh, in, in doing this project with the United Nations and with the uh, UN Environmental Program was uh, basically to combine uh, statistical data that typically come into uh, in the format of tables and, uh, and numbers. Uh, with uh, spatial data that are uh, used in any GIS environment to do spatial analysis. So combining geospatial data with national statistics was, was really uh, a challenge in this, uh, in this project. And, and um, maybe a perspective uh, about interoperability that can explain a little bit what is the challenge that we have in front of us. So the challenge that we have in front of us in order to do natural capital accounting properly is to integrate different type of data from satellites, from surveys, from national statistical offices, from uh, national statistics, from geospatial information that might come from different institutions and to use them together to use the best data possible uh, to inform decision-making in terms of natural capital accounting. And that's basically the, um, the aim of the ARIES technology. And so uh, this is the presentation that I want to uh, uh, present to you now. Let me see if I can move slide. Okay, so uh, the first thing is uh, you, you know that we use this uh, acronym FAIR. So now my, <laughs> my point is to explain to you what FAIR means. But uh, first of all, maybe just to break the ice, um, a citation from Francois Soulard, who is, a, a, let's say, a, a leader in the, in the Department of Statistics for, the, for Canada. And he said that uh, without interoperability, data are far from fair. So it's a little bit of a, of a game of words to say uh, that without interoperability, we cannot be fair. So what is fairness? Fairness is um, this thing that now is becoming very important to, to institutions. For example, all the European uh, research projects are claiming uh, to produce fair products. And um, essentially, it's, a, it's an acronym made of four, four components. So the fact that what is produced, in particular data, is findable, uh, so that data has rich metadata and unique uh, identifiers, that these uh, products or scientific artifacts or artifacts in general are accessible so that, for example, data can be easily downloaded and used by uh, standard protocols. The third one is interoperability. So that data is interoperable. So the metadata use uh, an accessible and standard language that can be used in different uh, programming applications. And the data is reusable. This is re reusability is a tenant for uh, for science and for the scientific method in general. So the data can, uh, is well described and can be reused in other applications. Um, incredibly, uh, let's say 
that maybe the ne in the last years have improved a lot the findability and accessibility, especially through internet, online repositories, and and things like that. But we are still uh, kind of far away from interoperability and uh, and the reusability of the scientific production. And uh, this is a challenge. Uh, for everybody and it's a global challenge because we are faced with global challenges like climate change like biodiversity loss like um, human migration and we need all sorts of uh, knowledge in order to deal with that in the best way so uh, the improving interoperability and reusability is really important uh, uh, for everybody So the, the situation is a bit of a, we say a broken uh, status quo because it's not improving at the, at the speed needed to, to face these global challenges that, that I was talking about. So uh, for example, um, scientists from the global North, they tend to re re restart from scratch every time they do an analysis. So preparing the data, uh, put them in a GIS environment, clean the data, work on the data, the resolution, and, um, and it takes a lot of time. But typically uh, what happens is that this work gets done uh, with a little bit of delay, but it, at least it gets done. And uh, the, the thing is that modelers in general are, are not trained to do things in a different way to, for example, start from something that is uh, already well-documented and existing and, and build on that. And this is time consuming in the global North, but uh, also in the global South, especially in the global South, maybe sometimes the, in the global South, the data, local data are, are missing or are expensive to, to collect. Uh, so this is even more costly in the global South because it means that uh, applications uh, sometimes are not, are not even uh, uh, possible. And so there is a fundamental equity issue. So the point here is, uh, like Alessio was saying, to make natural capital accounting uh, um, following the CIA protocol uh, feasible in every part of the world and jumpstart this activity um, for, for every nation. And, uh, and this is basically what we are trying to do with our technology. Obviously, we are not uh, uh, the only ones in this, uh, in this because, I mean, it's a problem from natural capital accounting, but it's a problem for essential biodiversity variables. It's a problem for ecosystem services. It's a problem that we can see in many parts of the world. And so um, while doing this project with the Nas uh, United Nations Statistical Office and the United Nations Environmental Program, uh, we realized that it was important to uh, basically state uh, our uh, interoperability problem and a strategy to deal with that. So we came out with this uh, interoperability strategy that uh, I want to talk <laughs> with you about. Um, basically, there are four components in this strategy, the, the current state of uh, interoperability and a vision for the future. What are the roles and the responsibility of data providers, modelers, institutions, including national statistical offices? Uh, what's, uh, what is an implement, uh, a possible strategy to implement uh, interoperability, including pilot testing, in engagement of stakeholders, governance is quite uh, an issue, and then uh, the conclusion. So this is a, a document that is publicly available uh, uh, online, and I will give you the link uh, in, a, in a second. But first of all, why interoperability and what's the added value of having it? So uh, this applies to uh, CIA accounts, but also essential biodiversity variable, but also ecosystem services and all uh, these type of indicators. We want to have uh, rapidly recompilable um, accounts and analysis and computational workflows as new science emerges. So as soon as you have new data, data that is more appropriate, data that is at the final resolution, data that, is, uh, that wasn't there before and now it exists and is vetted by the community, then we want to be able to redo the analysis as fast as possible. To quickly produce and show the most recent trends as new uh, data become available and have a robust international comparison 
from starting from common global data uh, and customizing uh, with country specific data and make it easy so that we can bring the best science available in the hands of uh, decision makers and the public uh, in, a, in a fast way. And uh, I mean, there are tools uh, out there that have uh, I've been trying to do this. And uh, so we are not the only ones working on this, um, but, but let's say the progress is still uh, not as uh, fast uh, as needed. Anyway, we are moving towards uh, this vision. So uh, interoperability requires common uh, goals and standards. Um, let's say we need to go beyond the state of the art. Beyond, of, uh, beyond the state of the art uh, means that open science like it is now is not enough. We have data and code repositories online, but uh, basically this uh, always requires a human mind to go there to understand to mediate uh, and to and to document. So the the key point, the key message in interoperability that I want to pass to you is uh, basically machine machine readability. Uh, what we aim at is a very technological approach, but uh, the possibility of machine uh, that machines are able to understand uh, how to reuse um, scientific artifacts, and this basically requires semantic interoperability rather than synthetic interoperability uh, so that we can make automation possible uh, through uh, artificial intelligence. And basically this allows machine to pick uh, the data and the scientific artifacts that are needed and to put them in the right place in a certain computational workflow like we are doing in, in ARIES. Um, but I mean, uh, there are key stakeholders in this uh, and uh, there are key roles from data providers. Uh, I'm talking about national statistical offices, science agencies, academic scientists, of course. Um, they need to agree on these principles to provide the data using common formats and also hosting this data online and um, serving this data online. So this is a paradigm of uh, web services, of uh, distributed uh, uh, knowledge using uh, the potential of internet. So it means that the data are online and the data can be accessed online by machines. At the same time, we have modelers uh, that need to understand the best modeling practices that can make this uh, easier uh, to happen. So how to document models, how to build models that are not monolithic, but modular and uh, so that it can be used uh, in a, let's say it's comp uh, the, comp the model components can be used in a plug and play sort of uh, fashion. And also uh, obviously the peer review and uh, community vetting and consensus on the use of semantics. Then uh, national, national statistical offices and also other institutions. Uh, there are international initiatives uh, regarding geospatial uh, data uh, and how to maintain this data online and serve them online. And, and this, this is a, a question of governance. So where are these data kept? Uh, who is uh, hosting, for example, the, um, the physical infrastructure that is uh, hosting this, this data? So these are very important questions, but data, um, the type of data that we use for natural capital accounting, we believe should be public and uh, available for public use. So it's, uh, it's a, a very important question in terms of also governance and management of data. So how can we together as a community working on natural capital accounting envision uh, incentives that can move us beyond the, the status quo? And uh, for this, we hope that uh, we provide some kind of a way forward. Uh, one, one point is definitely to use uh, semantics and that is uh, flexible and shareable and easy to learn a language used to describe scientific observations. Um, the other part is uh, having open and linkable data online accessible and, and published uh, with the semantically annotated data. And then 
Again, not only data, but also models, like, like we said before, for natural capital accounting, you need biophysical models, but also you need, uh, for example, monetary evaluations. These are, in other words, models, and, uh, and these models could be online, available, open, and, uh, and shared in a Wikipedia-like um, fashion. So this, this is something that we are proposing in, a, uh, in the, our interoperability strategy. And uh, what, what one thing that I wanted to say is that this uh, everything that I've been saying until now was recently published in a in a blog post by the Geo Community, so the group of uh, on Earth observation. So if you go to earthobservation.org uh, and then you have a news and blog, you will see that there is a, a blog post that is called a scalable strategy for interoperability and reusability of Earth observation data and models. But funny enough, two weeks before uh, this uh, blog entry, there was another one um, about why people are essential in data interoperability. So until now, I've been talking about a technological approach. But let's be honest, uh, technology will not save us if we are not able to work together. We saw this, uh, for example, with COVID, uh, meaning that you can have the vaccine, uh, so that's the technology. But if you don't share the vaccine all around the world, you don't resolve the pandemic. And this is the same, essentially. We have the technology to do interoperable, to make interoperable, interoperable scientific data and models. But if we don't work together all around the world, we are not going to solve uh, the problem. And so the, the human side of interoperability is perhaps more important than the technological side of interoperability. Um, so moving forward, we would like to start collaborating with the, <clears throat> all the, the stakeholders that are important to, to address these issues. Um, we are happy to have the opportunity today to talk to you. And so uh, basically we are uh, open to find ways to collaborate with the Central Asia the SIA community. And uh, every feedback that you would like to, to share with us are uh, very welcome. And thank you very much. I think I, I'm within time, so 10.33 in, uh, in Bilbao, and I'm happy to take any, any questions. I see there is, a, there is a lot in the chat. I didn't follow the, the chat box, so I will stop sharing now and, and follow the chat box. Very good. Uh, thank you. Thank you both, uh, Alessio and, and Stefano, for your presentations. I think uh, a lot of the discussions in the, uh, in, in the chat were about uh, some of these tools, and, and Alessio responded to, to many of the requests okay. already and provided, Thanks, uh, Alessio. Provide, uh, provided the link. So let me, uh, from, from my side as well, thank you both for this. Uh, just to sort of, uh, colleagues, if you again would like to take the floor and ask questions to either uh, Alessio or, or Stefano on what you have seen here with, with the ARIES tool, <laughs> Uh, please do so. Uh, as you have seen, I mean, this, you know, this is quite an advanced uh, uh, tool uh, that a lot of time and energy has been spent by the scientific community, by the academic community uh, that uh, allows you basically to actually get uh, tables and maps for your country, right? Uh, so you can get already started on extent and, and some of the main condition indicators that, that Alessio mm -hmm. showed you. It was very quick, huh? you know, unless you ran uh, for, for the Moscow region, I don't know, maybe two, three minutes. It was very, yeah, very, very quick. And that was in real time. Uh, there was no no uh, cheating going on. Exactly. Yeah. And also with, us, with a small computer, by the way, Alessia is the worst computer of the team. But one thing that I want to say is that these are not pre-compiled data. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe this idea is not clear enough, but what happens is a user goes there, makes a query that can be a written query in the search bar or by clicking a box, it's a predefined query basically. And then a computational workflow starts and then you have inputs, you have calculation, you have algorithms. And so the computational work is done on the fly while you're watching the screen. So these are not pre-compiled data that we just make available online. Very good. Yes, thank you for that. And I think it's quite useful for people to also understand, as, as Alessio showed, the various data sources that go in. And if I remember correctly, people can add their own national data to train the models to work a little bit better and provide, provide that, uh, uh, that as well. Alessio, maybe you want to talk a little bit about how people can use their national data 
in Aries and, uh, and because I think people would be interested in that because a lot of the colleagues here probably have national data that might be a little bit more disaggregated. Uh, and then maybe Stefano, you can link that to interoperability and how that can, how, what some of the best practices are for national data sources to make it interoperable and put into Aries basically. So Alessio first and then Stefano. Thank you. Uh, this is a point that I also wanted to, yeah, to make when I read, uh, to give more information about training material, I'm sure that uh, the first step that comes to mind to user is how can I add my own data into the system. Uh, so uh, at the moment, we are also working to give the opportunity for users in the, in the next month to do this via the, uh, the Explorer. Basically, in the same way we have downloaded uh, the data, there will be an arrow that instead of going uh, down goes uh, uh, goes up, points up, and you will be able to by selecting uh, that arrow to load your data into the system. Then this needs to go through a process uh, in which we need to make sure that the data is uh, correct and is correctly annotated within within our system. Uh, and then this uh, can be made available to, to the rest of, of the community. For the moment, uh, the only way to be able to uh, incorporate data into the system is by using the K-Modeler, that is the interface for technical users, which we haven't shown in this uh, event because we don't have enough time to do that. It's, uh, yeah, it, uh, it's a developing environment, so it needs more, uh, it needs more uh, training to be used. Uh, but yes, we have the possibility, as uh, Stefano mentioned, to uh, the system digest every kind of data as, as long as um, that format is compatible with, uh, with our system. And we're continuously working on creating new adapters, are called, to ingest uh, all the different kinds of data that, that is out there. Uh, maybe I will leave now uh, the floor to Stefano so that he can explain in a more strategic way how um, this is done by National Statistical Office, which is our strategy. So uh, at the moment, uh, it's true that um, basically to use local data, uh, one has to use our um, uh, infrastructure the, uh, interface that is more technical and not as user friendly as the other one that Alessio was, was showing. Uh, but we are working on, a, on, on, on this, on automating this as well. So we hope to have um, something ready in the next six months, for example, so that basically a user would be, would be using the same interface, but also drag and drop the, uh, his own data and see uh, the model recomputed with, with his own data. This is possible, uh, definitely. And uh, we are aiming at uh, a time frame of six months, more or less. Um, then what we are doing now is basically to collaborate with nat uh, national statistical offices, um, working uh, one to one, telling them basically uh, how to how to do with uh, with the other interface, so the the K the K modeler. And what we are finding is that most of the times national statistical offices don't have the um, the let's say the capacity. Uh, to work, for example, with spatial data uh, that uh, typically are used in natural capital accounting. So um, we find that data are not well um, maintained in, for example, projections problem, uh, resolution problem, uh, um, metadata problem, any kind of problem. So we, it's really time consuming because basically what we are doing is also train them into GIS uh, capacity. That is not exactly our job, but, but yeah, I mean, something that would really help is to have uh, multidisciplinary teams uh, in national statistical offices so that they are also able to deal with the multiple type of data and uh, and also let's say following following the main standards that are available there like uh, the open geospatial consortium OGC standard the open geospatial consortium standards that is the for us is the our reference standard for uh, for uh, spatial data for example thank and, you yeah. But, but, but yes, basically the key, the, key, the key message from our side is that uh, we try to adapt to what is available rather than making the other way around. So asking, uh, let's say, to change data uh, for what we need. 
uh, but it's 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 sometimes it's really difficult because there are there are technical issues that cannot be solved uh, easily. Yep. So that's and the interoperability all, problem. <laughs> problem, yes. I mean, I think you know this is something that uh, statisticians deal with not only in the context of geospatial data but also different data sources as well in the economic sphere, in the social sphere. So, yeah. so colleagues here are well aware. Uh, even when you're trying to merge different data sources on, on social surveys and whatnot, it's, it's, it's a problem across the board with, with interoperability. I think there will be a lot of questions here. I have maybe one final question for, for, you, for you both. Uh, uh, just, well, comment first. I think this idea of interdisciplinary team has come across from all our presenters. So Okay, uh, good. <laughs> uh, Adam has mentioned it as well earlier and, and other colleagues yesterday, Short and, and Joachim as well about the interdisciplinary nature, nature of this. Uh, I just wanted to, to also ask, has there been uh, any validation of the, the model outputs? Maybe a couple of examples you can quickly mention. As we know, countries have done this uh, ecosystem accounts without the ARIES tools, and maybe there was a, a, an opportunity to, to, to confront the data uh, uh, to see how, how good the tool is uh, uh, as compared to other uh, methods. Uh, has there been any sort of study of that and how, uh, what has been the outcome of, of that sort of exercise, if it has been undertaken? Sure. I think uh, Alessio can, can give you some details on this. For example, in South Africa, we have done this type of work. Okay. Uh, it's super interesting there because they have this vegetation map, which is crazy detailed. And uh, we, have, uh, we have tried to do the same analysis, but using global data. So we were comparing the results. Um, and they were very happy, by the way, with, with the tool. <laughs> so that was already a win. Um, but uh, one thing that I want to say is that uh, the, let's say, the aggregate output typically comes from the, from the national statistics. So we are not uh, modeling the aggregate output. What we are actually doing is we are, we are distributing spatially the aggregate output at the national level uh, using spatial data. This is uh, the most challenging part uh, in what we have done until now. And um, so the question is not if the aggregate output is, uh, let's say, uh, coherent, but if the spatial uh, distribution is coherent and uh, and we have done this type of analysis so especially in our case studies one was south africa but we are working with uh, uh, 10 or so so uh, definitely i mean this is calibration a calibration problem but we we are working on it for sure and the results until now are quite satisfying please alessio build on this if you uh, can <laughs> Yes, uh, no, uh, just to give you more information on the collaboration that we have so far started, we're working uh, with uh, India on the ecosystem service part. And with uh, South Africa, we have been working in extent and probably will also start working uh, on condition. And then we have a number of African countries that also asked to uh, start collaborating with us. So. Uh, soon we'll be working with uh, Senegal and we have a plan to also work with uh, uh, other countries like uh, uh, Rwanda, uh, Mozambique and uh, also in other parts of the world like the Philippines. So there is a lot of uh, yeah, movement in this, in this area and uh, I found that uh, what is um, like the most interesting exercise that you started with them is to compare uh, what are the results uh, by using their national data compared with uh, uh, what are the results when you compile those accounts with global data. And this is something that is undergoing, is an analysis uh, that has been done. Um, and I think it, it's just interesting also to try to understand which data could be used for uh, comparability across uh, the world, if, uh, uh, to which level global data should um, for instance, have a resolution that makes sense for comparability across the world. So this is all work in progress, and I think it's very interesting. We don't have a, a certain answer yet because we're still uh, exploring this. Um, Yep, very good. No, thank you. Thank you very much both. I think it's very, very interesting for colleagues to hear. Uh, I hope everybody will have a chance to at least look at the tool, play around a little bit uh, with uh, especially the, you know, the 
let me call it the easy tool versus the you know IT programming tool uh, <laughs> to use some simple language. But I hope everybody will have a chance to look at that and 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 play with uh, the the tool and see what type of uh, maps and tables they can generate for 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 their country. And maybe I, I hope you know if they have any questions, they can reach out to us here, and then we'll. Uh, also pass it on to Alessio, obviously, and Stefano and, and their team, uh, or you can reach out to them directly. I hope that is okay, guys, if anybody's interested to, uh, to, to learn a little, bit, uh, a little bit more. So let me thank you uh, very much again. Uh, we are running a little bit short on time here. So Alessio, uh, Stefano, thank you very much for your, uh, your presentation and your insight. And again, colleagues, I hope you have, a, 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 now you have a tool that actually helps you start at least with some of the accounts using the, the global data sources that, uh, that are out there already, the satellite information and whatnot that uh, Alessio has demonstrated and then Stefano as well with the interoperability strategy that you can get a start on the extent accounts and some of the conditions and some of the services as well uh, to, uh, to see what is going on in the ecosystems in your, your country. Uh, so thank you both again. Uh, we're coming very much close to the end here, uh, colleagues. So I have a few sort of closing things. Uh, we will not make this very long. First thing is if everybody turns on their camera, I think it would be very useful for us to get a, a picture of, of everybody uh, so that we can, uh, uh, you know, who's here and whatnot. So please feel free to, to turn, on, turn on your cameras. Uh, we should have done this at the beginning, but you know, it's always uh, too many things going on. So, uh, let me just run through a few thank you remarks, closing remarks uh, uh, for, for all of you. Uh, so uh, first and foremost, let me thank everybody for joining us for these past three days. I think it has been quite uh, useful to hear of, in particular, the new statistical standard on the SCEA and also hear uh, uh, some of the advances on, on areas that we heard today from, from Alessio and, and uh, Stefano, this very exciting tool for compiling ecosystem accounts uh, in, in your country. And also sub-regional level, and also as, uh, Stefan, as Alessio showed rather, also you can do it at uh, river basin level and so on and so forth. I also would like to thank uh, uh, Ross Stat, uh, who supported this, uh, this project uh, and uh, 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 provided the, the, the resources for, for the interpretation that we had in, into Russian. Uh, let me also thank the experts that we had, uh, Shord, Joachim, Adam, Alessio, and Stefano, who joined us uh, today and yesterday uh, 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 for, uh, for their presentation and their, their hard work. And last but not least, I wanted to thank my colleagues, uh, Kai and Isaveta and Shuji. Uh, they supported us in all, all this endeavor. So thank you to, to the three of you for all your, all your efforts. We remain ready and uh, happy to help you as much as uh, uh, we can. So please do not hesitate to reach out with any questions you have on ecosystem accounts on the SEA central framework uh, and, and whatnot. Uh, and last but not least, uh, our great interpreters. Uh, I know it's not easy uh, to do these sessions, especially uh, uh, the pace can be varied from person to person. I know I talk a little bit fast, so thank you very much for all your hard work over the past, uh, past three days. So the last item on my agenda here before I forget is to remind you to uh, let me share the screen here. I hope you can see this uh, to help us with an evaluation. So here uh, uh, you can uh, see the QR code as well as a link for evaluation of this meeting. So please take some time to click on the link or go through the QR code and complete uh, the evaluation for this meeting. Uh, we would appreciate hearing your views on what worked well, but also what did not work well so we can improve uh, the effectiveness of these types of meetings in the future. Uh, so I don't know if my colleagues Kai or Elisabetta have any other last minute announcements or if I forgot something important to mention. Okay, I don't hear anything. So without further ado, thank you again, everybody. Please stay safe uh, and we will see you soon in other SEA related events. Take care and bye-bye for now.